Welcome back. How do my socks look? To the Roth Show. was young, about 19, early 60s, whatever, my pop was in school and we were living in student housing and my mother would take myself and ultimately my sister and I to every uh, free rehearsal, every free art gallery opening, every free uh, practice session for the marching band, the orchestra, the opera. Uh, so necessarily for a young, uh, overly uh, hyperactive mind, uh, Broadway and the big numbers and the colors and, you know, whether it was uh, Mary Martin as Peter Pan swinging across the stage uh, on the end of a rope, literally. I think it was Manila Rope back then. There were two fireplaces and you would see the stage and she was as Peter Pan would launch and there would be six guys, big guys, uh, you know, with uh, suspenders on like, you know, longshoremen or whatever who would hoist the rope and she would float across the uh, stage and land on the other mantle for the other fireplaces. Ultimately, you saw Eddie Van Halen doing that upside down in the Panama video. I never told him where I got the idea, but uh, young forever, huh, kid? Peter Pan. Careful what you show your kids. And the two most resonant elements of Broadway or uh, the Great White Way or anything of legitimate popular theater that really resonate for me would be West Side Story and Damn Yankees. West Side Story, when it happened in the early 60s, was so dangerous that as young kids, we weren't allowed to go see it. Puerto Ricans with pointy shoes, woo, be careful what you show your kids because it could happen anyway. <laughs> And damn Yankees with a theme song, You Gotta Have Heart. Miles and miles and miles and miles of heart. I don't care if that's you trying to win the, the, uh, the great chase for the Yankees or if you're trying to be a SEAL team, SEAL team member. You gotta have heart. If you want to be a president or if you want to be a gangland uh, overlord uh, something czar, you gotta have heart. The same recipe. And I learned it from seeing those songs uh, on television. I didn't even actually go to the plays. I was compelled to sit in front of them as a form of culture. Hey, here's something good on television. And uh, of course, then I would act those out up until I discovered rock and roll. But G. Officer Krupke is probably part of the symphony I've been writing in terms of Van Halen in my entire career. We do tend to rewrite the same symphony over and over and over again, uh, spiritually as well as musically. And I was uh, trained early on as a kid, uh, professionally, musically, four times a week playing saxophone. And uh, I knew a lot of those quote unquote show tunes coming off of Broadway. G Officer Grumpy were very upset. We never had the love that every child ought to get. Lyrics as a way of telling a story were always closest to my heart because mm, I wasn't really an actor and rock and roll hadn't really happened for me yet. Something else very important already had and I'll discuss that in a second. But in terms of lyrics, somewhere between uh, what was happening in West Side Story way back then and perhaps what Elton John was doing with uh, Bernie Toppin around Yellow Brick Road. Those two were very close, I felt. And as an exercise, I thought, what if you would mix the lyrics from West Side Story with Elton John? Goodbye Yellow Brick Road kind of era in terms of the music he was doing. Or verse vice, take the lyricist from Elton's position and mix it up with Bernstein, etc., because they seem to kind of make a sense. Uh, at least in what I was cobbling together mentally here, if not uh, musically. And as an exercise, what would that sound like? 
So I thought, let's try and write a play. What story would we tell? Well, any story that you tell is autobiographic, especially when you try not to be. Even if you try to turn yourself into Conan the Barbarian with a neo-Nazi tattoo and you're in outer space and you are a robot who comes back from the future to become a championship undisputed boxer who decides to become the first Filipino president, That's, you're telling your story. Well, that was kind of my story, but <laughs> as you can tell, what's it, what you can tell right from there that I live in my own little world, but don't let that stop you from leaving a message. Dave Roth right here on The Roth Show. Don't go away. We'll chase you. The idea was Broadway, a play. We'll start with the word Broadway, but we'll think bigger. We're going to think in terms of virtual. We'll think in terms of maybe it's uh, a graphic novel, ultimately. Maybe it's a video game. Maybe it's a movie. And, you know, what's the big word in Hollywood? What's the most important word about any theatrical effort in Hollywood? Sequel. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's a nine-part sequel, <laughs> like Rocky. Think big, paint with big easels. But it probably starts with a one-man show. It probably starts on a small stage. And uh, maybe we pick up uh, somewhere at the Cafe Wa and simply myself telling you the story. Maybe we'll uh, add in a dash of what Mike Tyson did so eloquently. If you haven't seen his Undisputed uh, production, you got to see it. You know, it's everywhere, so go see that. Dial in on that. And uh, we'll throw in a little bit of that. Put some video screens behind us. Uh, maybe we animate. Maybe it's everything. Of course, my version of Broadway, one-man show, three-part uh, series, sequel, movie, autobiography, whatever you call this, will necessarily be a musical. And there are some 40 different musical and spoken word with groove, rhythm, tempo, etc. stops here. The music, of course, will reflect a whole lot uh, of neighborhoods. I frequently refer to music in terms of neighborhood, not style, not category, not genre. It's about the neighborhood, like who is, who's wearing what hats and what shoes, what kind of haircuts are involved. That tells you kind of what's in the musical library of the cars driving by. In this music, uh, we're about to show you over a number of episodes, there are some 30, 40 stops uh, of different musical moments, and they cover a lot of neighborhoods in the production here. Uh, it strays very far from Van Halen style neighborhood kind of music. So put your patience hat on, put your traveling shoes on, and get ready to really go uh, sightseeing. We're going to take the scenic route musically here. And the music was written and performed with a number of uh, sterling professionals. And as we approach each moment, then uh, I'll certainly discuss that in really fine detail because we had a ball putting this together. Let the next few episodes perhaps serve as an answer to what do you do in your spare time, Dave? What do you enjoy as hobbies when you're not working with uh, the Van Halen brothers? What uh, kind of music do you like besides rock and roll? Uh, there should be a, a fair amount of answers to these kinds of questions here. And uh, most of this was done over the course of about a year and a half, two years. Some of the material uh, you would hear periodically in some of the Roth show. Uh, 
uh, I would give up and temporarily lose the will to continue in terms of a Tommy-sized production and say, well, let's use some of this for another song or for some of the episode. However, in terms of the, in the whole uh, greater picture here, I present to you now with great description and background and footnotes. The New York City way. When that porter yells, New York City, I'll be there with bells, New York City, only place for me, New York City, homesick as can be. Spread the news today, the New York City way. Curtain opens up on a theater type stage, much like the Book of Mormon, and you see shadows of people setting the scenes. You can't really tell, but they're moving uh, lamp posts. You see silhouettes of buildings, of cutouts with lights in between. Perhaps we're using video screen behind us. It's uh, drawings that are distorted, but uh, kind of in uh, Fritz the Cat, Felix the Cat, type Fleischman Brothers. Remember when Betty Boop, no, you don't remember, but I do. When Betty Boop was dancing and the buildings turned into ghosts and so forth. And you'll see these kinds of apparitions and specters moving across the stage as we hear a big band version, a gorgeous, lush, well-dressed, overdressed, over-tipping version of Jump. And that's what we see on stage. The curtain pulls apart and we see the specters of the ghosts of the sets about to be shown for the show moving back and forth. And we see a fella who looks much like I do right now in a tuxedo singing, Might as well jump. Might as well jump. Might as well jump. Go ahead, jump. You may as well jump. And at first, you'll probably think that that's me. We'll refer to my character in this production as Dero. You probably think it's Dero at first. You know, ah, this is the ultimate conclusion to a career. Perhaps it's not the ultimate conclusion that you would think, uh, you know, if this is based on any reality at all. And in fact, you begin to realize that that's not reality. The person you're looking at is the devil, and you're in hell. And he begins to talk about dedications, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus, it looks dead out there. And he starts giving away little clues. You don't realize quite. You may even have to make it to the end of the show before you realize that that's the devil. And he's kind of one of the narrators of the show. You'll hear his voice and you will see him again as one of the characters. Think of him as Ray Walston, arguably one of the best devils in cinematic history coming from the movie Damn Yankee. And uh, in Damn Yankees, you know, he's always, so what do you think, Joe? What do you think? <laughs> that kind of insidious, uh, conniving, constantly scheming character would make him perfect for an agent or a manager in show business. Pay attention. There will be an exam on this later. And he begins making dedications. And he's talking about some of the crazy souls who have shown up in his audience tonight. But there's one who got away. There's one that he's still chasing. And he goes back in time. He starts to narrate, uh, particularly during the instrumental part of this song, the big band version of Jump. And he starts to ruminate about when he first met young D. Rowe and uh, became aware of this young lad's existence. And we go back in time. Hey, hey you. Oh baby, where you been? You say you don't know. You won't know until we begin. Jump is a song that 
Okay, it's a verb, so you can't go wrong with that. And it's timeless in its songwriting structure. And it certainly lends itself to something very dressed up and very well made up. I smell expensive cigar smoke, uh, women's perfume. I smell scotch on the rocks and love on the rocks. And a little bit of Las Vegas when it was Rat Pack time. And when shoes like these were considered fancy schmancy. And it was something that uh, an artist would reach for in your career, that if you could make it to where Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra and a whole host of others ultimately found their way to, then you were climbing some kind of a mountain of pinnacle. Of course, this all went to the wayside when action, reaction, you know, youth culture showed up uh, on the heels of the very early 60s and said, no, we want to go to outdoor concerts and we want to play in the mud and we want to smoke pot. And say, hey, I'm right behind you, kid, but I'm not going to wear these shoes. Well, I might now. <laughs> But that being said, uh, I see it both ways. And uh, I grew up in that generation that was compelled to at least understand it both ways. You had to understand the idea behind a tuxedo because they were getting drunk. They did have groupies. They did enjoy the quote unquote high life and did world travel, etc. And we were very much a part of that. Flying down to Rio was, even if you didn't know where Rio was, as you knew the jet set, even the idea of jet set was something cool. Tiki culture was everywhere that you could go in the United States and it spelled tropics and Hawaii and who went to Hawaii? It's fucking Elvis and Sinatra. You saw the movies, so <laughs> you would want to sign up for that, at least uh, culturally. You actually wanted to, you would prefer to be a Beatle or a Dave Clark Five or then ultimately a Rolling Stone and a, and a Zeppelin. But you would want to live like Elvis. Viva Las Vegas! Viva Elvis! Viva and Margaret! Viva the excitement when these two let themselves go on a wild and woolly world through Funtown, USA! Having described one neighborhood, the Las Vegas Rat Pack, elegant, uh, classy, low and brow beer gang, there was another neighborhood that uh, still rings true much more so today, and that was downtown. That was urban. That was African-American. That was what James Brown later declared around the 1965 to be black and proud. And if you had even a note of soul within you, that was the neighborhood that rang the bell within you. Now this was right before Motown and uh, one of the most popular songs at the time that defines what was going on at this time period was a song called Last Night, which is what follows the big band jump version. <laughs> Now, think montage like you're like at the beginning of a Spike Lee film, or uh, we've seen it in, uh, I don't know, we'll call it the University of Belmont Avenue in uh, Goodfellas when you talk about playing in the neighborhood. My first time of walking through the streets of the village in New York was 1960, the summer of 60, 61. And that was a time when kids did play in the street and ran around on the stoops unattended all day. The only time you went home was when it was dinner time. And for me, in that, that first summer, is, you know, that was right upstairs above the comedy cellar, the Cafe Watt, down on McDougal and Manetta Lane. Um, the music that you heard coming out of those windows was material like Last Night, or it was Latino, the very first thing that I saw on stage when I went into the famous Cafe Wa, my first trip there. I think I was about seven, eight years old, was Eddie Barclay in uh, Virgin Islands, Mediterranean, not Mediterranean, Caribbean, Caribbean rhythms. It was Virgin Islands Steel Band. And the music was everywhere. Television was beginning to really uh, create a stir. Movies were everywhere and they were double features. 
There was a lot of money bouncing around. It was easy for people to get a job, particularly interurban. Everybody knew that you could go to New York City and get a job very quickly in the late 50s and early 60s. So there was a huge, uh, we'll call it an avalanche, no, we'll call it a... Uh, uh, it's an ambush. It was a cascade of soda pop bottles, transistor radios, Brillo boxes, uh, pop art, cartoons, uh, material like uh, everything from Batman to Marvel Comics was slamming at home. All of the TV shows were young and go-go. Lots and lots of fringe. Lots and lots of movement. Hullabaloo, Shindig, Hollywood a go-go, Lloyd Thaxton show. The list was long. And top 40 radio was the voice of it. What's the voice of Top 40 Radio today? Because you weren't around for that with Betty Boop or Big Band or any of that shit either. So you know where you can find the voice of Top 40 Radio? 1010 wins. If you're driving in from the airport, LaGuardia, JFK, put it on 1010 wins, and that's the sound of what AM radio was about. It's kind of scratchy, scratchy, screechy, noisy, fast. I hear the sound of ticker tapes in the background, or maybe that's just my old memory kicking in as well, because why would you have ticker tapes in the modern day and age? I don't know, because it's fucking 1010 wins, and that's the sound of New York City, which was the sound of Top 40 radio. And even the DJs, I'm trying to imitate the DJs, DJs now hopping and bobbing and popping with the best bet for the boss beat at the top of the pop smash. Gold, I'm right here on 1010. Wins will be right back after this. Hopping and bobbing and popping with the best bet for the boss beat at the top of the pop smash. Gold, I'm Diamond David Lee, large in charge like a Nike missile in the Cheerios. Wake up, Big Apple LA time. Radio, baby. Smoking hot. Hopping and bobbing and popping with the best bet for the boss beat at the top of the pop smash. Gold with the timely tunes for those with the textured taste right here on Top 40. Of the morning from the screaming boss jock wrecking crew top 40 in your ear short distance from me to you baby transistor radio it's a go go you yeah. mighty 1090 xcr be a million watts straight at you on the mexican breeze all night long wolf man howling at you talking about it if you call that talking oh, last night what it was about transistor radios back then, but my girlfriend got great reception on this filling in her molar. And we had this crazy way of making the volume go higher and then lower, and then higher, and then lower, and then higher, and then lower. Top 40 sounds like, do you want to dance? And if love is the question tonight, it's going to be constantly asked. Jacked up, baby, and on DJ Coffee poured twice through. Get on the phones. We're going to be taking the seventh caller with the same tattoo. My beachfront van is searching for you and you and you and all of you this afternoon who are tuned in short distance from me to you right here on Top 40. This was the energy that was filling the streets and filling the hardware stores and the convenience stores and the magazine stands and the delicatessens and the department stores. And you know, New York City was generating all of that kind of noise. So during the montage, when we see young d walking through the city streets and saying hello to the deli man, the fella who's working at the magazine stand, I knew all of these people. The uh, 
lady, the fortune teller who sat on her uh, one-piece thermomolded country plastic chair and uh, during the, the hot uh, August afternoons when she didn't have business. And I would say hello to all of these people because my uncle was the Duke of McDougal, Manny Roth. Again, you know my stories of Uncle Manny. And Aunt Judy, who was the princess of McDougal. So everybody knew little D Road, you know. Uh, and I had my way in and around the, you know, there's about a two and a half block area and going into the park as well, Washington Square Park. Uh, so the beginning scenes take place there, and we see our kids. Think of the, a, a little kid like in Stand By Me, striped T-shirt, what we called dungarees. That means blue jeans, but you made a cuff maybe. It's got the seam on the side. Dennis the Menace a little bit. I actually did make uh, a handful of uh, slingshots when I was a kid and you're walking through the street. You're saying hello to each of these individuals. Each of these individuals are gonna show up again later in the dream, so to speak, a la Wizard of Oz. So memorize the faces. Oh, yeah. Junior makes it up the stoop and into the apartment, and his family is much like Saturday Night Fever. Uh, or Don John, if you've seen that movie just recently, I recommend it, it's really clever. But uh, these are familiar families. They populate a lot of films and a lot of television series, whatever. Uh, Pop is a taxi driver in the play. Mom is a Lucille Ball kind of housewife. And uh, they are not supportive of uh, any bigger dreams than making a living and creating a family and living the American dream Levittown style. Uh, Long Island style, what have you. Uh, little Junior, he's got bigger dreams. He's a product of television and film and uh, theater and Broadway and the streets of big time screaming, take a bite of the Big Apple, New York City. And uh, you can tell this from their conversation at the dinner table. He, of course, has to retire up to his little bedroom. Uh, and she's despondent because there is a, uh, what was called a generation gap. And uh, he is sitting in his bed, and we can see this Broadway style, something that's uh, on a stage. And we see a bed, single spotlight, maybe a little desk for doing homework. There's a gooseneck lamp and silhouette. And he is laying in bed, and he begins to listen to underground radio. Underground radio was just beginning at that time. Uh, on the East Coast, you had what I'll call the omnipotent DJ, fellas who talked like this, like the jazz DJs. And then on uh, West Coast, we had Wolfman Jack, who was broadcasting on the mighty 1090 XCRB. And he talked like this, baby, live in front of the naked eye. I can't do that without joking. <laughs> Ah, at least I have my health. And I have Wolfman Jack to blame for a lot of that, too. <coughs> I consumed every product he sold me at that time, as did every kid listening on the, uh, the little, uh, what's it called, the little transistor radio, which you had to listen to. Only at night could you hear Wolfman Jack howling over a million watts of Mexican radio, which was right over the border, which is why they were so powerful. Somewhere in between is what's boiling up in Little Junior's head, and then there's a third neighborhood that I have yet to describe to you. In every little boy's bedroom were pictures of cowboys. The big war was over and done with, World War II, Korea. I'm still not quite sure where that is on the map without going, uh, no, don't use the computer. But that had kind of started come, go, whatever Vietnam was starting. We couldn't place where Vietnam was either. So your heroes were cowboys. That was Gunsmoke, Have Gun, Will Travel, Paladin, uh, Chuck Connors, 20 Mule Team Borax, and on and on. These were uh, big time black and whites. They were not Hopalong Cassidy. The heroes were more Clint Eastwood style. And I think Clint it was in a few of these series as well. And we all had big life-size posters, even Elvis had a life-size poster of him as a cowboy shooting Andy Warhol. 
made that into a pop poster, did it in a number of series, a number of uh, posters in a row, and we all had exactly that because it was young, it was hip, it was Warhol, it was Elvis, and it was also Gunsmoke. Every little kid had at least one of those posters on his wall, and in, our, in Junior's bedroom, there are three of them behind him. And he's laying in bed, and he's starting to listen to underground radio. And we hear the voice begin to speak some quasi-metaphysical whatever. The music you're about to hear here is Ann Dudley Jazz Coleman. And uh, Ann journeyed to, uh, I believe it was Egypt, and played with the National Orchestra here. That's the music that you hear in the background. It's myself, of course, speaking like the omnipotent DJ with bullshit elimination that was so very popular of the time I my 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 You can't tell a book by its cover, but you can tell how much she's going to cost. If love is a collect call, it's an answer to a question often as not. But if I love you is a question, here's an answer that you probably do not want. It's imponderabilia. The only thing we know for certain is, hey, you never know. Aren't all who wander lost together all alone. And why does Brilliant have a sell-by date while dumbass rolls on and on and on and on? It's a ponder of Love exists, would we still persist in chasing it? Let's skip all of this emotional shit. This and more imponderabilia while we ponder this brief message. No higher low, it's all the low. Like pop art, it's the uncertainty. Common objects speak to me, they reinvent. Disillusion with your disillusionment. Ever stop to think and forget to start again? Diagonally parked in a parallel dimension. Your cell phone dies, and then it's imponderabilia. 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 Now, sarcasm and ridicule were refined art forms at my family dinner table growing up. And you could be a critic of anything as long as it was reasonably witty, uh, extremely well thought, and it helped if you were hilarious. So, yes, I do make fun of what underground radio and the search for the alternative lifestyle may have portended or pretended as the case may be. That's the sun in my hands, man. Oh, it gives off an orange cloud of light that just flows right out over the city. Wow. Underground radio was the voice of the underground press, the Oracle, the uh, East Village Other, the I, the Los Angeles Free Press. These were all elements of uh, the new art forms, cartoon art, uh, comic art. Uh, 
freestyle editorial, uh, kind of a boozy gonzo approach. Hunter Thompson uh, was has his roots in this kind of journalism, and that kind of journalism is what was going on on underground radio. And whether or not it had any substance at all, the medium was the message, and the message was, this is very real, and there's more to it than just selling you Coca-Cola, even though they were selling us Coca-Cola at the same time. This is what we listen to under the covers, because unless you could afford a big, heavy pair of Koss headphones, which you had to be an audiophile, and I'm still not sure what that really means, although it has vaguely sexual connotations. So now I'm interested, frankly, and we'll turn off the camera and discuss that later, because, you know. <laughs> Whatever, but who can afford fucking cost headphones when you're 12 years old, nine years old, or anything? You were lucky if you had one of those little Grandpa Abe hearing aid things that you put in there. It was somehow a little more interactive if you actually just put your ears next to the speaker and hid under the covers because your parents never knew you were doing that. late 50s and early 60s up until approximately 1963 as my memory serves. The only real black material that you saw on television was arguably still to this day some of the best. And I'm talking about the tap dancers, the flash teams, the fellas who did it long before there was any opportunity for super duper stardom, before there was any MTV or anything but an occasional role in somebody else's movies. And there were two Flash teams who were the closest to my heart. They were introduced to me by my uncles. And you would watch for them on the Million Dollar Movie or you would search the uh, TV guide to find one of the old movies from the 1930s or the 40s that they were in. And I'm talking about the Nicholas Brothers and the Barry Brothers. Now, it always makes me smile somewhat in inwardly, and I've never discussed this really in public, when people assume that I'm imitating Mick Jagger and the fellow who sang for Led Zeppelin, and to some degree, of course, we all do. But much more so, when I was jumping off the drum riser and touching my toes, I was imitating the Barry Brothers, launching themselves over an invariable number of balcony uh, railings and stairways, and they would launch themselves over each other. And that's who we were imitating as little kids, because it was the only contact that you had with African Americans up until James Brown, approximately 1964 or 5, we would see him on Ed Sullivan or the uh, Teenage America show. I think that was 1965, somewhere in there. Motown, of course, came slam dunking in, and that was uh, 1963, perhaps, 1964. But I was watching television, and television was my babysitter, as it was for many baby boomers six, eight, nine hours a day. My pop was in school or working, and mom, same, same thing. So uh, watching for these flash teams, these tap dancers, and attempting to imitate their moves, because they were much sexier than Fred Astaire. They were much more inventive, much more sassy, much more downtown, much more grit, much more mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, you would get up at 2 in the morning. You would get up at 5 in the morning to find Channel 11 or Channel 13 in order to find one of these uh, little cabin in the sky or one of these pictures. The Nicholas Brothers in particular were uh, mainstays for me and then ultimately my sister uh, long before John Lennon and Paul McCartney made their bid for my personal stardom. to the bedroom. Young Dero is under the covers listening to underground radio in his bedroom at his parents' apartment. It's probably New York City, but it could be pretty much any inner city around the world. And this is kind of my story, is a voice pops out of one of the uh, Elvis Cowboy posters and says in a distinctly African-American accent, what is that shit you're listening to? 
young D. Rowe looks up at the posters, and the faces in three of the Elvis posters have been replaced by black faces, much like Lawrence Fishburne in Pee Wee's Playhouse. And they look down at him and begin to question the veracity and the truthfulness and the reasonability of what they consider that hippie nonsense that's coming out that underground radio you hiding under the covers. And of course, young D. Rowe is astonished and begins to have a, a question and answer conversation. Uh, and the uh, three characters, these are the three wise men, we'll call them. The three wise men are actually Dave's inner voices. Now, this should come as nothing new to all of you who are somewhat familiar with what I do for a living or who I am today, that my inner voices are black. Well, that shouldn't be headlines that my inner voices are African-American when it comes to anything regarding uh, aesthetic sensibilities, spiritual, social, sexual, that those voices are exclusively African-American and black should not surprise you at all. That we now depict it popping out of an Elvis poster and trying to convince me to get up off my bony ass <laughs> and take care of business they happen to be dressed as cowboys simply because they were occupying the Elvis body purely as a vehicle during this one song. Later, of course, they're going to re-represent in a variety of costumes and represent a variety of neighborhoods, all the time being the voices, the three voices of my conscience. We'll call them the three wise men. And they sing an original song, and it tells the story, the three wise men telling this little white boy, don't piss me off. Ah, can't take no more. 